Ever since I was a little boy, all I ever wanted to do was play baseball. Even at an early age, after I had learned to write in cursive, I would always practice my autograph in hopes that one day I would become a big leaguer. The skinny blonde kid from the central Florida beach town of Melbourne, who wasn't good enough to play on one local junior college team and was a power hitting first baseman on another, wore a Red Sox uniform for 17 seasons as a pitcher. He was competitive and determined. Every time I stepped on that field, I gave everything I had. Kind and generous. Good girl. Well respected. He can help out a team in so many different ways to become so valuable. And successful. You know, I, I don't throw it for him and I don't pick his leg up and I, I, I don't think for him out there. I mean, he, he has made that transition. He's number 49, Red Sox legend Tim Wakefield, on this special edition of the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy. the Atlantic coast of Melbourne, Florida. That's where Tim Wakefield's grandparents settled in 1955 because his grandfather's Air Force tour finished there. And that's where his parents, Judy and Steve, met. He was born August 2nd, 1966, in Melbourne. He was healthy all right, breaking out the ball and bat at a very early age. He loved ball playing from the first, so age two. Here at this house, he would get out with a his plastic baseball bat and ball and hit from one side of the house to the other. Just before he turned two, his lone sibling, his sister Kelly, was born. And although he had a head start, as they grew, it was easy to tell who the better ball player was. It would have to be her. She was, uh, she was very talented. So it kind of pissed me off a little bit that my sister was better than me. His father, a power hitting first baseman in local softball leagues, passed the love of the game to his son while mixing in some of life's lessons. I tried to teach him basic, the, the, the basics of, of, of baseball and, and uh, tried to teach him good manners, uh, tried to teach him good sports. I, I started playing t-ball at five years old and um, just fell in love with the sport and wanted to play. And, and my father played softball, obviously, when, when I was younger and his, uh, when I was around four and five and used to watch him play and I wanted to be like that and go play that sport. His sophomore year at Melbourne's O'Galley High School, he wasn't going to play baseball, or so he thought. O'Galley High School baseball coach Ken Campbell was in the car as the instructor for Tim's first driver's ed class. And he says, uh, I'm going to see you out there for varsity tryouts today, and I, I said, Yes, sir, I'll be there, and uh, ended up making the team. So he pitched, and like his father, played first base, but not well enough to be drafted out of high school. So from O'Galley, he went to play up the street at Brevard Community College, where he and the coach didn't see eye to eye on his playing time. Well, we butted heads pretty hard that fall season. I ended up quitting. I didn't want to play baseball anymore. I was just going to go home. Uh, I was going to get an education and uh, try to get a job somewhere. But before that job came about, another local coach, Les Hall, from the Florida Institute of Technology, talked Tim into playing for him. Tim could hit, and Tim could hit with power. And he did so right from his first game at FIT, breaking a scoreless tie in the bottom of the ninth. Tim hits one over the right center field fence to win the game. And it was a pretty, it was 400 feet to center field, so it was probably about 450. He also messed around a little bit throwing a knuckleball, but not during games. That was the whole key for us, is to try to, try to hit each other in the kneecaps with it. That was the whole purpose of throwing it, just having fun. He wasn't a pitcher because his skills were clearly at the plate, where he hit 22 homers his sophomore year and 40 over his career there, both school records. Finally, big league scouts noticed, and he was drafted in 1988 in the eighth round by the Pittsburgh Pirates. I'm like, great, you know, this is awesome. What do I do now? <laughs> Tim Wakefield finds out 
as this special edition of the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy, continues. With his parents and college coach Les Hall on hand, Tim Wakefield signed his first professional contract in June 1988. He was to earn $700 per month to play for the Pirates' single-A affiliate in Watertown, New York. The field at Watertown's Duffy's Fairgrounds was a huge step below the lush Florida fields on which Tim was raised. We get up there and the infield dirt is actual dirt. It's brown and gray and there was actually a racetrack. Part of the racetrack went behind home plate and through the grandstand. So they used our grandstands as grandstands for the racetrack. It was crazy. He roomed with two teammates. And the three of us shared one bedroom. We had three single beds in this one bedroom. We all shared a room. And my mode of transportation to and from the ballpark was a bicycle. A lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, trust me, uh, for lunch and then whatever hot dogs were remaining at the ballpark afterwards. The first time that we went to Watertown to see him and saw where he was living, I broke down and cried. I ended up hitting like 189 that summer, which wasn't very good. Just depression set in quickly and I just wanted to get home. He spent parts of the next season in Augusta, Georgia, and here in Welland, Ontario. He still wasn't hitting, and he didn't fit at any position, so the Bucks planned to release him. That is until teammates called Pirate Scout Woody Heike over to watch his utility infielder just goofing around. So I went out there and Tim was through the knuckleball. I said, gee, that's pretty good. And he says, throw a couple more. And he did. And I didn't say anything. I turned around and went back. Chuck Lamar was the, the fan director. And when he asked me, I said, well, I would like to throw him in the, you know, in the mound to see, you know, he's got a good knuckleball. So you should check it before you release him. Soon thereafter, Welland manager, former big leaguer UL Washington, became the first to use the former power hitter as a pitcher. If it gave him a better chance to to, to play the game longer, I was very happy to do it. Uh, you all came to make a pitching change. He says, hey, wait, come on in here. We want you to pitch. So I went from second base to the mound and pitched an inning in relief. That was my first experience of, of pitching. I just pitched. I tried to throw fastballs and curveballs and all this stuff. And I came back in the dug and he's like, what are you doing? We want you to be a knuckleball pitcher. I'm like, OK, nobody told me that. They just wanted me to be a pitcher. Thanks to the knuckleball, he shot through the minors to AA Carolina and AAA Buffalo, where he had 10 wins by July of 92. His manager summoned. Congratulations, you're, you're going to the big leagues. And I'm like, no, come on, really? You're like, no, um, they want you to fly to Chicago, uh, meet the team there and work out with them. And you're gonna start on, I think it was a Friday night. He called home to tell them he'd gotten the call to the big leagues. Finally, I said, you just got the call, didn't you? And he said, yes, but don't tell Dad. I want to tell him. I wanted to tell you both at the same time. He had gone from nearly quitting the game to nearly being released all the way to the big leagues. Tim Wakefield remembers his major league debut quite clearly when the Red Sox report presented by CVS Pharmacy continues. It was late July of 1992 when Tim Wakefield was called up to the big club, the Pittsburgh Pirates. So I throw the first pitch and it's right down the middle and Doug Harvey's the home plate umpire and he says, ball one. I went, oh no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> uh, so I throw the next pitch and he calls it a strike and I think after that I just kind of settled down. Settled down enough to set down a tough St. Louis Cardinals lineup. Just like the guys in the minors, they struggled to hit a ball that moved so much because it spun so little. He won that game and eight of nine decisions as the Pirates made a run to the playoffs. In those playoffs, Pittsburgh trailed two games to none when the rookie got the call to face the Braves and save the season. And tonight, Jim Leland turns to the only buck yet to appear in this series. 26-year-old Tim Wakefield, who takes the mound with the hopes of an entire city riding on a 47-mile-per-hour knuckleball. He went the distance in Game 3 and again in Game 6 as the Pirates faced elimination. The Braves would win Game 7, but Wakefield had done his job. As the 92 season ended, he had a promise to keep. Back in Melbourne, 
a friend had started a program called the Space Coast Early Intervention Center. The center helped children with various learning disorders assimilate into the education system with the so-called normal kids. Tim had promised financial help when he made it to the big leagues, and the timing of his call-up coincided with the center almost going broke. They're down to their last $12.50 in their checking account, and she's trying to uh, think of a way that she's going to tell these parents and kids that they can't keep the doors open anymore. The center held on long enough for Melbourne's newest celebrity to keep his promise by holding a golf tournament that fall. His first tournament raised roughly $35,000, saving the program that was close to his heart. Today, the Space Coast Early Intervention Center is thriving, and Tim just hosted his 20th annual golf tournament in January. The doctors said that a, that a man who would never speak, and on Saturday, she finally said hi for the first time to her mom and dad. Didn't you? Things were looking up on the field as well. Wake earned the honor of being Pittsburgh's opening day starter in 1993. After less than three months of Major League action, he was the club's ace, but not for long. He won the opener against San Diego. But since a knuckleballer doesn't throw hard, one of baseball's myths is that a knuckleballer can throw an unlimited number of pitches. That theory was tested April 27th of 93, when Wake threw 172 pitches, going 10 innings, earning a win, but paying a high price. It was, it was so bad I couldn't really raise my, my right arm to wash my hair or kind of brush my teeth. It, it was really sore. He lost five in a row, and he was lost on the mound. In July, he was sent back to the minors, skipping AAA altogether. Back to AA where I'm having to ride you know, buses for 12 hours back into the Southern League. Back to Carolina, where he continued to pitch poorly. Pirates GM Cam Bonifay visited to see another player. I remember a fan saying, hey Cam, why don't you take him back to Pittsburgh and throw him in one of the three rivers as we're trying to win a pennant down here. That vividly sticks into my mind as maybe one of the most embarrassing moments in my career. In 94, he was sent to AAA Buffalo, where he got little run support and ended up leading the league with 15 losses. Just my confidence was shot, completely shot. I, I didn't know if I was that good anymore, you know? In the spring of 1995, the Pirates decided for him that he wasn't that good anymore. They released him. I was trying to, to learn how to accept the fact that I wasn't gonna be playing anymore. I was gonna come home, I gave it my best. Um, I had a little bit of, it, uh, uh, of success in the big leagues, and uh, I was going to come home and work. Tim's craft, throwing the knuckleball, was so rare he thought no one could help. There was, however, a Hall of Famer who not only knew how Tim felt, he knew the cure. That's next on the Red Sox Report, presented by CVS Pharmacy. He had been the Rookie Pitcher of the Year in 1992, but by the spring of 95, Tim Wakefield was back at the beach, out of baseball and without a job. At home in Melbourne, he thought he'd go back to school to get a degree, but he still hoped at least one team would want him. One team did, the Boston Red Sox. Red Sox GM Dan Duquette asked Wake to meet in Fort Myers with Hall of Fame knuckleballer Phil Necro and his knuckleballing brother Joe also a former big leaguer. Finally, he'd be coached by people who knew what it took physically, and more important, mentally, to succeed as a knuckleballer. You eat it, and you sleep it, and you drink it, and it's 24 hours a day, you're a knuckleball pitcher. Take the fastball and put it in the garbage, you take the curveball and everything else you learn about pitching, forget about it. This is gonna be your life from now on. And, and you could be a, an SOB with that pitch. He was kind of teaching me pitch by pitch how, how to do it and how to try to get a reaction out of a hitter. And I told him that I can still feel him behind me sometimes when I'm pitching at Fenway or pitching on the road, that I, I can still feel him behind me telling me that stuff. And that stuff sure worked. After just four starts and three wins with Pawtucket, Wakefield was called to the big leagues. He won his Red Sox debut in Anaheim allowing just one run, 
and on just two days rest, shut out Oakland 1-0. Then he would see the inside of Fenway Park for the first time. The night we got back from Oakland, and I was able to actually walk through the tunnel and, and, and see the Green Monster for the first time, I was just in complete awe. Com just complete awe. You know, like you said, this is the Cathedral of Baseball, and I'm walking through the same tunnel that Ted Williams and Carl Yastrzemski and you know, Babe Ruth and you know, Cy Young and everybody else had, had walked through. It was just truly amazing. Just as he was in Pittsburgh, he was an instant success in Boston. I was 14 and one at one point, and you know they were all talking about Cy Young, and and the fears started popping into my head again about Pittsburgh, about you know all the success and and failure. But you know the the, the biggest thing was I, I still continued to pitch well, so well that he finished third in the Cy Young Award balloting in '96 and '97 combined. He won 26 games, but lost 28. In 1998, he was back on top of his game, going 17 and eight. I was dealing with failure a little bit better. I was, I was growing up, basically. As his game developed, so too did his commitment to the children of the community, both here and in Melbourne. He grew to love the work done at Franciscan Children's Hospital here, so he established Wakefield's Warriors, a program that brings Franciscans' young patients to Fenway Park for every Tuesday night home game. In 2009, the Franciscan Hospital for Children said thank you to Tim with a ball field named in his honor. The Tim Wake Field! Ready? Wow! Who's that, whose number is that is? Yeah! And in 2010, Tim received the ultimate recognition, the Roberto Clemente Award given to the Major League Baseball player who best embodies the spirit of the Pirates Hall of Famer on and off the field. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. This is the ultimate award. Um, this award deals with character. Um, you know, Jimmy Williams told me um, when he was a manager here, is like the only thing you'll ever take away from this game from you when you leave is your reputation, and that hit home with me. Uh, the eight nominations was good enough, but to ultimately, um, or finally win, win the Roberto Clemente Award really is a, is a very special deal. Back on the field, the 99 season saw him go to the bullpen to fill a void left when closer Tom Gordon was injured in April. He had success in the role, saving 15 games. That year was an unforgettable postseason for both the Sox and Wake. After trailing the best of five division series against Cleveland two games to none, they won three straight to take the series, thanks to eventual Cy Young Award winner Pedro Martinez, who came in to throw six innings of no-hit ball in the clincher. With the league championship series against the Yankees just days away and Pedro unavailable, Wake was thinking he might be the starter for game one. Manager Jimmy Williams had something else to say. You know, uh, we, we decided to take you off the roster. I was crushed. His teammates told him to stay, so he did dress out and watched as the Yankees beat the Sox four games to one. Three years later, the 2002 Red Sox were under new management and had a new manager, Grady Little. Things changed for the better. It wasn't a mop-up guy. It wasn't an insurance policy. I was an integral part in us winning. Late in the game, that I would preserve a lead or keep it close for us to come back and win. And that made me feel important again. The incredible highs and deep lows of the 2003 season sort of mirrored the slopes of his career. He was back in the starting rotation, including the postseason, just like 1999, with Pedro pitching the final game of the division series, Wake thought he might get the call to start game one of the league championship series against the Yankees. But unlike 1999, this time, he was right. He stifled the Sox's most bitter rival in game one, and then again in game four, when he allowed just one run and struck out eight. He would have been the clear choice as the team's most valuable player of the series had the Sox won. But when game seven went to extra innings, Grady Little looked to his veteran, the guy who could throw day after day, and the guy who had dominated the Yankees. He pitched a scoreless 10. Aaron Boone, let off the 11th. I'm confident because I've gotten him out so many other times before. 
I'm confident that I can get it out here. And there it went. Like, you know, it happened so fast. I can't pinpoint how it happened and why it happened. I just was trying to throw strike one and, and try to get an out, and they went out of the ballpark and game was over. Mike Timlin came over and gave me a hug, and then um, he kind of said, don't bow your head. You know, you should be proud of what you accomplished well, here. Fault, and I stood up, and, and Veritek was right there, and he embraced me, and uh, we both shed a tear together. The tears of sadness turned to tears of joy for Tim Wakefield as the Red Sox report presented by CVS Pharmacy continues. The 2004 Boston Red Sox were built on pitching. Co-aces Pedro Martinez and Kurt Schilling, sinker baller Derek Lowe, and veteran knuckleballer Tim Wakefield. Tim and the Sox were back in the league championship series, once again up against the Yankees. Tim was set to start game four, but the Sox were down two games to none and in a hole during game three. He sacrificed his start to save the staff. Here's Tim Wakefield with the mindset of starting tomorrow night, and now all of a sudden the Red Sox are in trouble, and here he is in the fourth inning. And then he appeared again out of the bullpen in game five, this time in a win. Wakefield pitches a scoreless 13th inning. Tim's selfless act helped his team pull off the greatest comeback in baseball history. And it earned him the start in World Series Game 1. Maria strikes out and a good start for Wakefield. That was Tim's final start of the season as the Sox swept the cards and celebrated a World Series title. Tim remained a key member of the Red Sox rotation throughout the rest of his 17-year career in Boston. In 2007, he celebrated a second World Series title. In 2009, 11 first-half wins earned him his lone All-Star Game nod. Your I body of work deserves it also. Thank you very much. Not only the year you're having, but the body of work too. I appreciate it. And late in the 2011 season, Tim Wakefield captured his 200th career victory. Tim's 200th win was the final of his career. In February of 2012, after 17 seasons with the Boston Red Sox, Tim Wakefield retired. For the past 17 years, all I've ever wanted to do is what was best for our team and the organization. Whether it was starting, closing, or whatever I was asked to do, I always had my spikes on and was ready to go. This has been the hardest thing I've ever had to do. So it's with a heavy heart that I stand here today, and I'm saddened to say that I've decided to retire from this wonderful game of baseball. To fans in Boston, he's always been number 49, knuckleballer Tim Wakefield. Now they can also call him Tim Wakefield, Red Sox legend.